going to go to the Luke 21. And we started this before. Last Sunday, we started from Luke 21, but we didn't really finish it. So in the first uh, passage, Jesus was sitting at the gate and there's a, a treasury and a, uh, a widow dropped two coins and we talked about how the true present to the Lord has to be done as a uh, as a sacrifice. Secondly, we talked about that it needs to be a done with the faith, with faithfulness, and also with gratefulness. That was the third point we talked about. So we spoke about those. We showed this image. And when Jesus was walking out of the temple, he spoke with his disciples. And verse 5 says that some spoke of the temple, how it was adored with beautiful stones. And he said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another. And this surprised his disciples because that was a, the temple was a huge structure. And we learn how difficult it was to ruin it because it was comprised of large stones. And if you see the artistic rendition of the temple, how magnificent it was. So Jesus said there a day will come or days will come in which not one stone will stay on, the, on another. So that was the question, what is that condition of Jerusalem in those days? Today, we're going to uh, study sufferings. From verse 7, and they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my, my name, saying, I'm here, I'm he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And, and this happened in the past, but Many people have come across or come forward through the history stating their Messiah, the Messiah, and that has led them to become sects. So going to verse 7. Teacher, when will these things be? So the disciples asked Jesus, and Jesus answered this. This is verse uh, 9. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must be first, must first take place, and the end will not be at once. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes and various places, famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, deliver you to up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before the kings and governors for my name's sake. And it's interesting that 
this message that he's giving them. And he said after that, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. So, settle therefore in your minds not to be, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of you, your adversaries, adversaries will be able to withstand and contradict. Clearly, Jesus gives several messages here. And Luke starts this passage. It appears that they're still in the temple, but when you go to Mark or Matthew, it appears that they're outside the temple and they're looking towards Jerusalem. And they see the beautiful temple of Jerusalem and the walls around it. When I went to Armenia first time in my life, we have elementary schools, middle school, etc. We're used to Mount Ararat in Lebanon. We had we had never seen it, and we always saw it in pictures. But when 1999, I went to Armenia the first time, and it was 5 a.m. in July. One day. There were no tunnels to the planes, so we just landed and I came out of the plane and I saw Mount Ararat. And even today, I get shivers when I say these things because that mount was in pictures for me, but when I saw it in real life, it was no longer a myth or a history for me. It was a reality. So Armenians take pride in Mount Ararat, and that's how we present ourselves. And the same way for the Jews back then, Jerusalem was their object of pride. So when I ask you, what's the object of, of pride in your in your mind? Think about it. What is it that you're proud of? You're in a church, I understand you're going to say Jesus. If you say something else, you're going to get uh, the looks. But my question is, what is the position of your heart? What is the most important thing? When you look at Mark and Matthew, this question was a little from a different angle. They're asking, what are the signs, if you have the Bible, looking at verse, verse 7? They say, when will these hap things happen? They don't ask. They don't ask. They don't ask why. They ask when. And, so, and, and how. They don't ask how and wh why. They ask when. But they don't ask why. They ask when. How is the enemy going to conquer the uh, the temple? What is that might that the enemy will possess to conquer the through the walls? And Je Jesus' answer wasn't focusing on when, but he focused on the signs. In, in Matthew 24, which is the same story, it says the uh, disciples approached him on a separate, separate occasion and asked these questions. So the question is about the last days. What is that sign of the end times? Uh, 
If you look at the events in the Middle East, you will not no longer question if question if we're in the last days. So what is that sign? Jesus doesn't answer when it will happen, but he's giving them the signs. So when they see those signs, they'll be ready for the Jesus coming in the end times. Don't forget that Matthew, the, his, his gospel was written for uh, for the Jews. That's why he is emphasizing the last days. In Luke, he doesn't emphasize the second coming of Jesus or the last days uh, necessarily. The question and the answers are different between Matthew and Luke. I'm just going to share quickly. So Jesus gives the signs. Many will come and say, this is me, Jesus, and the times have have come. Verse 9. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified of these things. Verse 10, it says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be, again, his focusing on signs. Verse 11, there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Cosmic things will happen. When you look at R.C. Sproul's preachings, uh, you'll realize how he nicely summarizes all of that. Verse 12, but before all these, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons will be, and you will be brought before kings and governors. These are the signs that will happen. When? When the temple of Jerusalem, right before the destruction of the of the temple. In other words, uh, he's telling uh, disciples, you're going to be persecuted and suffer, thrown into jail and before governors and kings, and that's uh, prophetic uh, speech here. And my question is, has this already happened? And when you look at the uh, book of Acts, he, we learn about the life of Paul, Apostle Paul, and how he is brought before the governors and kings, and with boldness he speaks about the gospel and he gives his witness. When, when Paul was called to ministry, Jesus told him that he's going to do these things. So the Holy Spirit gave the same message to him. As, and verse 13 says, this will be your opportunity to bear witness. So all of this will happen, will have happened before the destruction of the temple. Verse 17, you will be hated by all of for my name's sake. So again, this is all before the destruction of the temple. Now here's the interesting thing. The Spirit of the Lord leads the, to the following. How to get ready for all of these things. Does that mean we just have to just sit down and wait for these things to happen? Or pick the best church and just attend, attend it? What are we supposed to do when these things happen? I had a joke, but I'm not going to 
be sa sarcastic. Verse 8, let's go back. It says, see that you're not led astray. So the first thing that the enemy does is trying to deceive us and to lead us astray. It's very imp important for us not to be deceived easily. If someone approaches us and uses deceptive speech, we have to be careful not to be deceived. And when Messiah comes, the Messiah, the false messiahs, they'll say, I am the truth, believe me. And it says, at the end, in the end days, there will be many such people. And you know what happens when you led astray? You follow them when you're led astray. Secondly, there'll be wars and tumults, and what it says in... It says, don't be afraid. Have you ever been uh, terrified when you hear about war, uh, uh, wars? If you talk to Armenia, yesterday we're talking to some pastors from Armenia, and it's clear when you talk about Armenia's current condition, everyone has terror and fear in their hearts that they don't uh, trust the government and in addition to that they don't trust the neighboring countries who are the enemies so when you don't trust your own family and your neighbors it's a, a natural thing to be afraid of but jesus says do not be terrified do not be afraid not because we are strong, but don't be afraid. We've seen in the word of God where it says, do not be afraid. It doesn't say you are strong. It says, don't be afraid because I'm with you. When you go to, through deep waters, I'm with you. My presence is your strength and power. And it says, don't worry about protecting yourself. Because the words that you need to speak will be given to you. Just trust me that I will give you the words that you have to share and you will be surprised that when you open your mouth, God gives you the words to speak. I have a quick story. When I did my first uh, funeral service, I was 27 years old. And I had never been at a funeral service. And here I was, I was a pastor at a funeral service. I don't know what Edgar felt when he started his funeral ministry, funeral service business. So I was very much ready when I went. And the casket was next to me. And of course, we know who's there. And um, I'm uh, ready to share. I look at my, my notes and they make no, no sense. And in, in my mind, I imagine that the person in the casket was moving. And my logic says that's not going to happen, but I was really terrified. And I completely forgot what I was going to speak. And I had seven hours to prepare for the message there. And I only had one word. Pray. All these people are gathered for me to say something, and one word came, and it was in English. Frailty. 
Uh, higher than Pada. Not sure how it is in Armenian. Uh, frailty Pada, or I say, Cheskir Nartun Hakte. You're frail. You're going to go one day. You cannot trust yourself in this body. But the Holy Spirit gave me that the message about frailty. If I, um, so that word frailty came out of my mouth and I started to speak and I don't remember exactly what I said but it was non-stop message and I can only imagine when Apostle Paul went went up and talked to others the Lord would give him the, the words to speak as he gave Moses the words to speak and he said go and I will give you the words to speak and those who studied the, the, past, the acts of the apostles we see how Paul and Felix do the same thing so Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple so Jesus talks about Jerusalem and jump to verse 20 it says here but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its destruction has come near then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let, let not those who are out in the country enter it for these are days of the vengeance to fulfill all that is written so this is explanation prophecy of what's going to happen and it says at the end these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written how many of us believe that whatever is written will happen i hope we're all we all believe it with in our hearts as well not just externally so Jesus describes that this is the vengeance of the Lord. And the Lord, the word of God talks about that it's not up to us to revenge. It's in Romans, but it says, do not reply evil with evil and be at peace with others vengeance and revenge should not be done by you revenge comes from sin the root of our sin is the pridefulness of one's self so don't revenge but because vengeance is the Lord's he will repay says the Lord it's not me saying Jesus himself said this God says this is vengeance is mine and it says for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written verse 22 and what's written everything that has been announced declared by the Lord here's my question what what is the purpose of the vengeance by the by the Lord can you do you remember when Jesus was crucified what did he say on the cross he said lord forgive them because they don't know what they're doing but there are people there who knew exactly what they were doing there was a generation they knew why they were crucifying jesus because their own pridefulness 
was challenged. And they, they knew why they were crucifying Jesus. And we know Jesus' crucifixion uh, was for one purpose to deliver us from our sinfulness. His death was for our salvation and also for our liberation from our deliverance because we have been leading burdened life by sin. And he had to he had to go through that crucifixion and then resurrect to liberate us from all of that and give us victory. And his crucifixion was our, our victory and our liberation and deliverance. God gave it to us for but then he is here, he talks about vengeance. And the vengeance was directed towards the, the generation of those days who knew what they were, they were doing. Verse 23, but what to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies, in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon the people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword. So here we see two pro prophecies. Number one is that those are the days of the vengeance, so that to fulfill all those to written. And according to the history, during the same generation, this prophecy was fulfilled. This happened 30 to 37 years after these words were spoken. The Jerusalem's temp temple was completely destroyed. And truly, no stone was left on another. And, and the Jews were spread out in the region. And it's essentially, Jews as a nation uh, ceased as a, as a country, but they never forgot about their nationality. They never forgot about God's promises I'm not I'm giving you as a Jewish uh, from Jewish history it didn't matter where, where they were they were praying that one day they would return to Israel you can read the history even today non-Christian Jews they follow Jewish traditions and they pray towards Jerusalem. They haven't forgotten about. And I, I don't want to compare Jews with Armenian. This is not a political preaching. And they went to other countries to choose. They registered many successes. But those successes didn't matter so far as they hadn't re returned to um, Israel. And verse 24 says, they will fall by the edge of the sword and let uh, be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled un under food by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. If you just woke up, let's read this. I'm going to read verse 24 again. They will flat the, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled on, under food by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The, 
point here is the Gentiles salvation when the gospel reaches Gentiles and up until that point they will be trampled underfoot and be fall by the sword until all the nations hear and accept the gospel. So God's prophetic purposes were fulfilled through the Jewish nation. And we know in 1948, Jews received their homeland back. And we know 5 million Jews were killed during the Second World War. In 1948, they received their homeland. I wasn't alive back then. When you look at the history, it was truly a miracle how Israel was declared as their homeland, and that was the land that the Lord has promised through Abraham. Abraham. And I remember this very well because I was, I was already born when 1967 Jerusalem was restored. I was 10, and I remember very well, I was four, fifth grade, and I was back in the Middle East, it went dark completely. And it was 1967 when the war happened, and, and after that war, Jerusalem was declared occupied by Israel. And uh, a few years back, Trump declared, during Trump's era, Jerusalem was declared the capital of Israel. My, my, my message is that through Israelites, God's prophecies are being fulfilled and we live in those realities. And the, the following prophecies of God will also uh, come to pass as well. So what's the goal of my preaching today? Number one, God's word is trustworthy. Number two, Jesus predicts the future. And when he predicts the future, be sure that whatever he predicts will happen, just as he says. Next, we live in those days when in front of our eyes, we see how prophecies are being fulfilled. I don't know how many of, how many of us will see death before Jesus' return, second coming. But we live in those last days. Especially in the last sentence here where it says, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We're in those times. Verse 24. If you haven't devoted your life to Jesus, not that you don't believe, I was talking to traditional believers, universal believers, I said, I would say, and one of them was asking, everyone is one, God is one, so why are we quarreling about this? And the other guy said, you have to believe that Jesus has died for you, rose from the dead, and you will be saved. And I looked at them, and I said, Satan also believed that Jesus died and rose. But the, there's a difference between Satan and us who believe. 
when we believe we give our lives into his hands and we trust him that he takes our life, molds it, renews it and gives us a new heart when we give our lives to him. At that, at that point, it means I submit my will to him in submission and surrender. If you haven't made that decision yet, you believe, if you're here, you're a believer, obviously, but there is one, the most important thing, which is when you accept him as your Lord and Savior. And if you're a true believer, let me ask you, if you're ready, are you ready to lead a life of submission and and perhaps as a believer and devoted Christian, you've accepted him with your mind, your you are convinced that he's God and you confess him as Lord. Perhaps you've already said it with your heart, but perhaps you're not, you're not, you're not living that life of Christ. When your life doesn't show Christ, you live in fear because he is coming back and the rapture that will happen will happen is unpredictable. And I, my prayer is that before I end my sermon today, the rapture will happen. But those who are going to be baptized, we pray that it will happen later. But joking aside, it's an inevitable fact that will be there will be a resurrection and uh, rapture. And if you believe that you're not ready, and there are fears in your heart, that you will confront those fears today by reconciling and confessing and opening your heart to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you examine hearts of people. You examine the depth, depths of people. You know everybody's minds right now even as we sit here. And Heavenly Father, one day we're going to stand in front of the truth, in front of you, and give you an account of our life. My prayer is, Lord, that those who hear this message, they would be worthy of your judgment. And if they're not a believer, this would be the day where, when they would open their hearts to you and they would turn away from pride and self-centered life. And I know there are believers here, Lord, that haven't been renewed recently and haven't been intimate with you and their sins that still linger in their lives. You know them, Lord. And Lord, I, I am assured that your Holy Spirit rebukes them, convicts them. And I pray that they would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and would come before you and repent. Renew us, Holy Spirit, God. Amen. Amen. For your glory. Thank you, everybody. God bless you.